Greetings, everyone, and thank you for being a supporter and fan of the Robert Sylvester Kelly um, R. Kelly Appeal TV program, where we discuss topics of the appeal and where the criminal case is headed. And we thank you so much for joining us today. It has been a beautiful and yet sad time to grow this channel here on YouTube. However, we thank you for all of your likes, comments, shares, subscribes, and um, we're just keeping an eye on the king of R&B, and this is our pleasure here. So I believe everything works in unison and within a balance for Every win, someone is going to have to fail. But as we know, we just need to exhale. You know, um, we're all going through this. This is a trying time for all of the loved ones of Robert Sylvester Kelly. Um, so I was asked to give a review on the book titled Soulless by Jim Diragatis. And... At first, I felt that it wasn't necessary for the Appeal TV information. It didn't connect. Then as I meditated, I figured I needed to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly that has been said against our brother to see why we still believe what we do about him, to make it loyal, to make it balanced. So I will not be reading it word for word, I don't believe. I will, however, look at the information and discuss how it relates to the Lifetime docuseries, which took Robert Sylvester Kelly down just by testimony and documentaries um, with no type of support, no type of, you know, facts, factual evidence. But when major news stations such as it, CNN, NBC, um, Fox TV, Court TV, when they decide to report something, they tend to show it in the way that they see it, how they want you, the viewers, to see it. This is why I wanted to run the review of the Solus book written by Jim Derogatis, because I think, in my mind, I really and truly feel... I really and truly feel that he is the greatest hater of R. Kelly. What are some of your thoughts and views about the um, person who was working with the anonymous tape that just randomly showed up in his office? I remember watching a video um, one day with, I think, Samuel Jackson or, or Denzel Washington, and he fell asleep, got high. Um, someone came in his room and framed him with all types of tapes of pornography. And, you know, he was found guilty for having those in his possession. So randomly, a person shows up in this dear goddess's, you know, office and no one knows who the person is. No one realizes that, you know, he could have been the very one to create the video because as they said in a video on trial that they could, they were not able to even identify the characters in the video, but they believe it looks a little similar to the person. Um, that was... <clears throat> A sheer problem for me. What are your views about it? Um, the synonymous tape. Should we look? Should we be looking at at Derogatis to why this showed up in his office, being connected to the Me Too movement, the Dream Hampton connection? All these are ma major questions that we need to ask ourselves. So it was in that message I decided to choose to incorporate Solus in this Appeal TV information. Um, so thank you, Olivia S., for suggesting I do include this book into the R. Kelly um, Appeal TV. So let's get started. All right, Solace, The Case Against R. Kelly by Jim Derogatis. Um, 
copywritten to 2019 by Jacket Abrams, published in 2019 by Abrams Press, an imprint of Abrams. All rights reserved. No portion of this book may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any other form by mechanical electronic cop photocopying, recording, and otherwise without permission from the publisher. So that is the reason why I'm not going to be reading it word for word because of copyright um, infringements that come with uh, YouTube. So the essential account of R. Kelly's actions and their consequences of reckoning two decades in the making. So in November 2000, the Chicago journalist Jim Derogatis received this anonymous fax that alleged that R. Kelly had problems with young girls. Weeks later, Derogatis broke the shocking story, publishing allegations that the R&B superstar and local hero had groomed girls had sexually abused them and paid them off. Derogatis thought his work would have an impact. Instead, Kelly's career flourished. That right there tells me that he was trying to bring him down. Um, just off of anonymous facts, just off of, um, you know, <laughs> someone saying that this is happening, someone saying that this was taking place. I believe that it had to set the stage for the um, documentary that would happen 20, 30 years later. And, um, you know, you got to remember R. Kelly came from the hood and he was not supposed to excel to the areas in which he did in the industry. But the people loved him so much until they could not hide the talent, the gifts, the blessings that surrounded Robert Sylvester Kelly, R. Kelly. So then he says, no one seemed to care, not the music industry, not the culture at large, not the parents of the numerous other young girls, but for more than 18 years, Derek God has stayed on the story. So he stalked R. Kelly, basically. Um, and as far as no one seeming to care, of course, no one's going to care about an anonymous, an anonymous conversation from someone who's not even strong enough powerful enough or courageous enough to come forth and stand on what they're saying these allegations are. I know this to be true and it's fact because da 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 and I'm willing to put it on tape. I'm willing to go to the police with it. I'm willing to do whatever. But even going to the police, you were not going to, in November 2000, you were not going to have enough evidence to even you know, get the police to write a report because it's allegations. It's like someone slandering someone and saying something false about them. And um, so no one seemed to care. And that's the reason I believe that no one seemed to care. So list the case against R. Kelly is Derogatis's definitive work. This is his most powerful work that he's ever done in his entire career. A combination of tenacious journalism and powerful cultural criticisms. So he criticized, he analyzed, he's, he's dissecting, and he's trying to bring down the artist known as R. Kelly. And I'm just wondering why. Why did he take an anonymous situation? And when you have women who are open and able to do whatever they want to do with their bodies, you know, um, with this superstar, what made him so, so uh, 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 passionate about creating this storyline out of something that just came out of the blue? Um, wow. It tells the story of Kelly's career, the dear goddesses investigations in the world in which the two cross paths and brings the story up to the moment when things finally seem to have changed. Decades in the making, this is an outrageous, darkly riveted account of the life and actions of R. Kelly and their horrible impacts on dozens of girls by the only person to tell it. Why was he the only person to tell it? Why didn't the girls come and um, tell their parents, tell, you know, um, 
tell their counselors at school, tell their pastors, tell their Girl Scout leader, tell their teacher at school, their counselor. I'm sure something came in the way to show that this supposedly was going on because of the character changes and personality changes in these young girls that would have um, altered their lives to some degree. And do you notice that no one ever talks about what these people are doing, what these women are doing to this day? Um, <clears throat> what are they doing with their lives? Are they successful? Were they successful prior to R. Kelly? And where did all, where did the success and the balance of life take them after the conviction? That's what I need to know. So let's look at the prologue. So in this anonymous fax, D. Regatis says that Robert's problem is young girls. He intended to make a quick trip to go to his office on the day of Thanksgiving in 2000, but while other people stayed at home. So there was hardly nobody even in the office for him to, you know, validate for Derogatis, Derogatis to even validate that this fax showed up, that it even came. Um... And so he's sitting there, he's getting himself together and he's, um, and, and now he begins to read this, this facts. Dear Mr. Dirigatis, the facts, a one page single space letter began. I'm sending this to you because I don't know where else to go. Well, you go to the police, you go to, um, you know, someone that you know that you can trust to help you figure it out. My review of the latest album by singer, songwriter, and producer R. Kelly had run as a lead story in the entertainment section on November 7th. So this was the same day that TP2.com arrived in stores. So he was trying to, he was stalking them and uh, he ran a review November 7th. And this was the same time that, you know, he was trying to prevent people from purchasing the music from R. Kelly. So like celebrated film critic Roger L. Ebert, whom I probably call a colleague, I disliked reductive ratings or thumbs, but our editors demanded them. I thought a line in my critic nailed the dilemma better than the equivocal two or four stars I had given the disc. So basically he was saying that he was looking at the disc. He was listening to it. He didn't give it a thumbs up because he felt like, you know, that's not what he did, what he does. Cause he was hating on him. Okay. You wrote about R. Kelly a couple of weeks ago and compared him to Marvin Gaye. The letter continued. Well, I guess Marvin Gaye had problems too, but I don't think they were like Robert's. Robert's problems, and it's a thing that goes back many years, is young girls. Okay, so in 1990, in 1994, people were um, saying that R. Kelly was the greatest, you know, hip hop, R&B, African-American male that was on the scene beyond Bobby Brown um, and all the other rappers, singers uh, that were there during this time. My stint as the paper's pop music critic began in 1992. So he started criticizing him in 1992, not long after Kelly rose from um, the city's L platform Dear Goddess left in 1995, making a brief foray to Rolling Stones in New York. So all this stuff was going on. And for some apparent reason, this particular man was stalking R. Kelly during his time of just coming forward. He said he got a lot of angry letters, facts, and snail mail in response to the record and concert reviews. They were especially numerous when he criticized um, people in the hip hop industry, calling it noise. Readers commonly complain, although the fax letter was signed a friend. I initiated the fax letter was signed a friend. 
I in intentionally dismissed whoever wrote it as just one more reactionary jerk trying to disparage a black superstar. Why would you do that now? If you're stalking him and believing that all of this stuff was noise and that he didn't deserve what he got early on in the career, why would you now decide that a friend who sent you an anonymous fax says to you um, that, you know, all this stuff, he's, he likes young girls. Okay. He put that on the platform. So he created a backdrop to the future situation that R. Kelly has now been in fa been facing. So he intentionally at that point dismissed whoever wrote it as just one more reactionary jerk trying to disparage a black superstar. Yeah. Okay. R. Kelly, R. Kelly likes them young had long been a rumor on the music scene, almost always whispered in those exact words. By publicists and recording engineers, radio programmers and concert promoters, fellow critics and fans. Gossip said he married his 15-year-old protege, Aaliyah, in 1994. That story seemed strange and unlikely, and both of them had denied it. So how is it that two people deny something that they are gossiped about and the world continues to believe that this had actually occurred? Um, it had been little public discussion about what those words actually meant, and I'll confess I didn't think about them much after the first time I heard it either. Although this book in two decades of reporting on the pain R. Kelly has caused dozens of young girls began with that fax. I initially tossed it on the pile of press release, artist biographies, and angry letters from aggrieved readers stacked in a wire bin filled to overflowing to the corner of my desk, eventually destined for the trash. Exactly. That's what should have happened. It should have been thrown away because it was their word against you know, the people being gossiped against. So I believe that R. Kelly has started out um, in an area where there was a lot of hate, a lot of jealousy, a lot of disrespect, and he still, you know, persevered through it because of his passion. So with that, this Dear Goddess dude, I mean, I don't know. And as you read, I started reading some of the pages in this book um, when I go back and say that, you know, the media gave us what we needed to know about this situation and then let it go for us to decide. And this is the reason why I'm doing this book right now for us to choose to make a decision on what we're choosing to believe about any any of the areas of R. Kelly's career and his personal and his life as a now convicted felon. So moving into that, in the book, it's going to show you um, accounts of public record and how public record um, has been uh, disorganized, how public record has not, you know, followed the rules in which it created for itself. You know, you think about a time when you have a birth certificate and they're stored and they're stored and they're stored. Well, what happens after 20, 30 years, you go back and look. Now all of a sudden, oh, things have been disorganized. We can't find who the, you know, the birth certificate. I remember there was a time when my grandmother was born in the 1900s, early 1900s. They didn't even keep records of birth and death certificates. So the just being a public, you know, figure and his life, his family and everything else. Was it documented correctly? Is this Aaliyah, Robert Sylvester Kelly marriage certificate, was that even legal? Was it legal? Not in a sense of her being young, but was it even legal because of the fact of the paper it was written on? Did someone, you know, create that? Because as you see, the two people involved are saying that it wasn't true. 
So, wow, this book is getting good as I read. So, we're going to move into chapter one. He going to grow up being a shooter. In the video, he talks about a video of I Wish Robert Sylvester Kelly stands in this uh, high rise overlooking a dramatic skyline and he calls the sin he calls it the center of my universe. He gazes up at the crisp blue sky. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? And um I want out. The singer replies, removing his shades, but it's hard. I need answers, mama. He turns his back. I need answers. So all of a sudden, R. Kelly is seeing in the midst of moving into this life with this new career after leaving the L platform, he sees that something is not right and he needs some answers and he wants some answers. OK, almost all of Kelly's albums brings bedroom jams with soulful prayers or pleas and a nostalgia of being in his old neighborhood where he grew up. It was bittersweet. Now, um, songs on the radio is bumping in everybody's ear. The 2000 video portrays Kelly surrounded by friends and family on a wooden porch. Um, and someone's braiding his hair eight years later, the same woman braiding his hair would testify that during a break in filming, she had a threesome with Kelly and an underage girl in his luxurious trailer. Folks don't know the half. See, and that right there <laughs> is something that makes me curious because if this woman had a threesome and she knew that this girl was underage, at what point was it her accountability and her responsibility to either tell, report, or go down with the Robert Sylvester Kelly uh, child pornography um, case that he is now incarcerated for doing? So now rock and roll comes down with this myth about, um, you know, the facts that, that there are no facts from the beginning. Kelly excelled at building the myth. I have talked to only one of three of his half siblings. And aside from scattered quotes around a journal, the primary source about his formative years is Solar Coaster, The Diary of Me. Kelly's 2012 autobiography written, but with David Ritz, the author of more than three dozen celebrity stories. The book gets some of those um, mentions wrong. So now he's criticizing the book, Solar Coaster, saying that the siding of the corner streets don't intersect, referring to buildings that never existed, misspelling the name of Kelly's younger half-brother throughout. Ritz views his role as conveying what his subjects want readers to know. And there again, for someone to criticize someone else on <clears throat> conveying information, well, it seems to me that with all the stalking that this dear goddess guy had done upon Kelly from the very beginning is one of the reasons why I believe that what he's saying right here is one of the roles that he's conveying to even the readers of Solace. And then he even took the title Solar Coaster and changed it to Solace. It's just a hater move. I can see it. I can see it all day long. I remove all issues of control of the book by giving complete control to them. Ritz said that when we appeared on a panel together in 2003, Kelly disowns some of his chosen collaborative's work. He didn't get everything on point, Kelly told Chris Heath, just like no one ever does. So why would Derogatis have to bring this up to show that the Solus book was a lie in some forms, okay, in some of the things that was said? Um, when you say things, you know they'll get them all misconstrued. I've read a couple of things in a book that wasn't exactly how I said it. And this is R. Kelly being real, um, talking on a show and talking about the book Solar Coaster. But you see how Derogatis came, took that information and used it against him to create a book about him against the case of him um, <clears throat> and, his, and his innocence. It's really weird. Um, According to his driver's license and court records, Robert Sylvester Kelly was born January 8th, 1967, 
a since deleted section of the Cook County website devoted to homegrown athletes, celebrities, politicians, and more reported that his mother, Joanne, hailed from the Caribbean island of Guadalupe. She gave birth to Robert at Chicago Lying in Hospital, part of the University of Chicago's healthcare system in the High Park neighborhood. County law does not grant access to birth certificates to anyone but the child and the parents. And if a father's name is listed beside his mother, it remains a mystery. So this dude really um, is trying to work very hard at sharing information that we didn't know about Robert Sylvester Kelly or his family and using the way that the um, Chicago public system was working against information. So he's trying to set it up as though he wants us to know that this is genuine. Um, but how did he get the information again? How did he know? Um, and yes, no one has ever talked about Joanne Kelly coming from the Caribbean islands of Guadalupe. Um, Mm. He says, Joanne herself is a ghost in public record searches, and Kelly has never mentioned her Caribbean roots, if indeed she had them. The county is not immune to screwing up the facts. A friend of the family told me Joanne and her mother actually moved to Chicago as part of the Great Migration when millions of African Americans fled the racism and poverty of the South in search of better opportunities in the cities of Northeast and Midwest. Chicago, which was 2% black in the early 1900s, had become 33% black by 1970. Many African Americans relocated to the South and West sides of neighborhoods like Brazenville, Pullman, and Austin. There they formed a black belt marred by poor housing stock and fewer retail businesses but rich with music venues and churches that served as centers of community hubs for activism during the civil rights movement and political power basis thereafter. So all four of Joanne's children had different fathers. Robert has an older half sister and half brother, Teresa and Bruce, and a younger brother, Carrie. The family called Carrie killer after the unseen boyfriend of the flamboyant character, Geraldine Jones portrayed by Flip Wilson in a drag on his early 70s TV show. This was a big, complicated family. At times, Robert and his half-siblings lived near or with his maternal grandmother, four uncles, female cousins and aunties, and a name named Lucius, who married Joanne and became the stepfather to her four children around the time Robert turned five. A self-professed mama's boy, Robert resented everyone else for Joanne's attention, and he disparaged the marriage. But the grants in his book that Lucius was a nice man, nice to me, and most times to my mother. Most times, Kelly also recounts several physical fights when his mother and stepfather drank. Whenever he asked about his own father, Kelly says in Solar Coaster, my mother would just roll her eyes and tell her, tell him, don't talk about it. So she admits to having bad habits, smoking. Um, and we went over this, but the one thing that I want to begin to do in this reading is talk about the things that we did not discuss in the Soda Coaster um, playlist series. So I'm going to stop here. What are your thoughts on Mr. Jim Diragatis? I mean, to me, he seems like a person who needed a lift in his career. And he took some gossip and bullied information to others. So, yeah, I will be reading the chapters before I talk about them. So I'll know a little bit about what, how this uh, segment is going to go. Let me know what you think about it. Should I keep reading it or should I leave it be because of the fact that Solus has nothing to do with the appeal? I believe it does have something to do with the appeal because of the fact that R. Kelly was truly indicted and charged and convicted of these stories that have so many loopholes in them until I know 
that that is going to help protect him when it comes down to his um, appeal. So yes, thank you so much and we'll see you next time. And as always, keep it 100.